Hey yo, and what is up, gang? Thank you for checking out Sledgehammer TV tonight. I'm not in a coma, which is good, but that doesn't mean that the show tonight was any good. Monday Night Raw tonight had the return of the Raw Tag Team Champions. They had a new debuting superstar for the first time ever on the show tonight, but they still managed to be their same old painfully boring, very, very long selves, and it was not any good or any better than it's been all year long. We are going to talk about all of it right here and right now. The good, the bad, and everything in between. My name is Nick Nightmare. You are watching the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show's Monday Night Raw Review and Reaction Show. Let's do it. <laughs> So we finally found AJ Styles and Omos. The Raw Tag Team Champions haven't been seen since winning the titles at WrestleMania, but thank goodness they have returned to Monday Night Raw. It made such a huge difference now that the champions are back on the show because it's clear that they took this seriously, right? They've been gone for so long. WWE had four weeks. They had four full weeks to come up with something great to do with AJ Styles and Omas when they came triumphantly back to Monday Night Raw. But instead of giving us something new or something cool, like seeing them maybe defend the titles versus a new team like the Viking Raider Warrior Raider Raiders, or maybe having some sort of a gauntlet match between whatever tag teams you could scrap together so that they have something to do at WrestleMania Backlash. Anything interesting like that? No, that's not what they did. All we got was a WrestleMania rematch of AJ and Omas taking on the New Day with the championships on the line. Now, this match was announced prior to Raw even going on the air, which makes me wonder why the hell we needed a very long opening segment for AJ to tell us that he and Omas were partying in the Caribbean. They were drinking all kinds of shit like pina coladas and whatever, and they were having a good old time celebrating being champions, and the New Day thinks there's something wrong with this. And like, they come out and they interrupt the celebration. AJ Styles telling everybody, I'm a Grand Slam champion now, which is great. Omas won a championship in his very first match at WrestleMania, which is pretty good. And then the New Day come out and they rain all over the parade and everything, and it's not good that that they went and partied in the New Day's frame of mind because they're fighting champions and they would never win a title and then run off with their title and enjoy the fruits of their labor i guess but whatever be that as it may this was just a very long and bloated way to fill airtime to get to a match that we already knew was going to happen and again it was a almost the same thing that we've seen at wrestlemania here omas is not impressing me at the moment the guy's got the look he's got the big impressive gimmick down but he seems to be the very standard very generic wwe giant type figure that's you know that redwood tree giant that seems kind of stiff in the ring he doesn't really do very much at all and what he does do is limited at best but AJ and Omos retain their championships, beating the New Day here tonight. Okay, I guess that's a good way to start off your championship reign. What are they going to do from here on out? Being that there are no tag teams to even really go against. But we'll get to the tag team disasters that happened tonight, which tonight was a lot of tag team matches as we're moving along. But before we get to any of that, of course, we have to have Charlotte Flair and the whole Charlotte Flair segment. Now, we didn't do the Raw review last week because Raw just depressed me into a state of mind where I couldn't even get behind this camera. So we didn't talk about anything that happened with the return of Charlotte Flair. Sonya Deville, for some reason, is doing her dirty work on Monday Night Raw. She brought Charlotte Flair back, proving they can't even do suspensions right in this goddamn company. And then now this week we have Charlotte Flair getting a match 
with Dana Brooke, I guess because she asked Sonya Deville for one. They had a little meeting backstage and Adam Pierce is all pissed off about this, you know, because she's, uh, Sonya Deville is going over his head and doing all this shit behind his back. And I don't know who gave either one of these people any type of power in the first place. But yet here we are. And now with no explanation, they've moved from being the power duo on SmackDown to a power duo on Raw. I guess maybe because Sonya Deville decided to buy a fully red suit, they said, hey, you know what? Now you can go and work on Monday Night Raw. I don't know. You give me a better reason than that, and maybe I'll accept it because I just don't know. And while we're in the middle of all this Charlotte Flair nonsense, they decide to throw this little nugget at us. And they found a way, and I can't even believe they, they they are doing this, but they found a way to make the women's division even more unwatchable. And they are bringing back Eva Marie. She came back, she had a little vignette where she was dancing all over some sort of a car. Maybe it was a Corvette or something. It looked like a very late 80s rock video kind of vignette. And she's just looking all sexy and being all, you know, Eva. And she says that evolution is coming. And this is not what we need. And it's mind boggling to me that, you, you know, I was never a big fan of the Iconics, but you let the Iconics go because you had nothing for them. You let Mickey James go Hall of Famer, seven-time women's champion. We got nothing for you. You know, all the women on the roster right now, you got girls like Nikki Cross and Carmella. That We got nothing for you. We got no creative for you, but we got big plans for Eva. Eva Marie's coming back, and I already can hear the crickets chirping. I could care less, and I'm sure many of you can agree with me there. And, and you know what? I would be on a different boat with this if maybe she was one of those girls like a Deanna Perrazzo who left the WWE and then lit the indies on fire. But it's not like this girl left WWE to hone in on her skills and train and go win championship belts everywhere else to prove her medal. No, she went. She failed in Hollywood. She failed with a clothing line. She failed with a makeup design line or whatever it is she tried to do and now she's got no clout and she's got to come back and reestablish her image where it all began because she failed everywhere else that she stepped foot in since leaving so thankfully we have that to look forward to not only are we going to have charlotte flair down our throats we are going to have eva and the evolution where'd they get that from emma Remember Emma? They're redoing the whole Emma gimmick. The Emolution was coming. Very similar vignettes. The very high class, very sexy things for Emma before they let her go. But we ain't going to get that lucky here. Vince McMahon loves Eva Marie for the way she looks. So get ready because she's going to be crammed into our eyeballs on the worst show in all of pro wrestling as it is. This show can't write anything interesting for the women they already have. What makes you think what they got for Eva is going to be any better? Give me a fucking break. So then we have Elias and Jackson Riker hiding behind some, you know, equipment in the back and they want to throw tomatoes at the New Day who are sitting there and they're like recouping from getting their ass beat in the opening match. They got ice packs all over them. And this is all playing off of last week's ridiculous tomato segment, which I, you know, haven't even talked about because I don't want to talk about it. It was written by a five-year-old and it didn't deserve to be on Monday Night Raw. But of course, we have to go back to it a bunch of times tonight. Even AJ made reference to it and how silly it was in his little vignette at the beginning of the show. But here we are in the back and they're getting ready to throw tomatoes at the New Day. And once they release the tomatoes, they end up hitting Randy Orton instead. Womp womp. Oh my goodness. And then, you know, his little buddy zips by on his scooter screaming, hey, Randy. It was really stupid. And I'm just, I don't care. I don't care about anything they're doing with the tag division. Randy Orton and Matt Riddle would have a little bit of a moment later that we will talk about that everybody's going to be talking about because it made everybody chuckle. But just because you made me laugh a little bit 
doesn't mean that I'm fully on board with this RK bro shit just yet. But let's move on to the next matchup of the night, which was Charlotte Flair defeating Dana Brooke. This was wonderful to see on television. It ate up about five minutes of time. And then once that was over, Sonya Deville was out there for some reason. And Charlotte wouldn't let go of Dana Brooke after locking her up in the figure eight. And that would make Mandy Rose come out and get involved. Is that why Sonya Deville is doing this? I don't know. They won't talk about it, so I don't care. But then we get into this segment where Charlotte Flair wants to be put into the women's championship match. And she's telling Sonya Deville she's got to be fair to Flair, borrowing a little bit from the catchphrase Bobby Heenan made so famous back at the Royal Rumble in 1992. This isn't fair to Flair. This isn't fair to Flair. So now she's taken that from her father's repertoire. She's added it to her own thing. Be fair to Flair. And just put me in this match. I guess the WWE is like, well, you know what, Charlotte? Everybody thinks we just put you in matches anyway. So we might as well just do what they think we do anyway. And we'll just do it on TV to make them even more mad. So that they boo you and they hate you more and you could be an even bigger heel. Is that the thought process here? Because otherwise I don't understand it. This was really bad. Really bad stuff. You had Rhea Ripley coming out, and she was awful on the mic. She's like, this is a bunch of crap. Charlotte Flair wasn't at WrestleMania because nobody likes her. And then she accused Sonya Deville of planning all of this. This whole thing was a big plan by her since bringing Charlotte back. Then Asuka came out. She started yelling. She called Charlotte a crybaby. And she's like, I could beat them both. And Charlotte thinks she's going to win. And then... All hell broke loose. Charlotte took a cheap shot at Rhea Ripley. Then Asuka knocked Charlotte out of the ring. Asuka was dancing to her music when it was all over. And I wanted to dance my way to the bathroom to vomit because this shit was just ridiculous. I mean, who even is Rhea Ripley? She is the Raw Women's Champion. We don't know a goddamn thing about her. Her character seems flat and boring and without motivation. Her sim- her motivation simply is just to be the champion, I guess, until they give it back to Charlotte. I don't know. Because it wasn't in the plans. We can't give her any character development. Is she a baby face? Is she a heel? One week they're booking her one way. This week they're booking her like a baby face. It just doesn't make sense. Last week she was teamed up with Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler, was she not? This week she's coming out and acting like a whiny crybaby, like baby face type of champion talking about being cheated and Sonya Deville planning this whole thing from the start ridiculous and then Adam Adam Pierce confronts her again in the back and it's like why are you doing this what are you what are you doing I'm getting pissed off at this and she's like oh no I texted you and he's like oh maybe the building has poor reception but I I texted you and he's like, we share the same office. Don't tell me you texted me. And she said, well, no, it was an urgent situation. I had to make the decision right then and there. And then they just kind of stood there. And then the cameras went away. And she's like, well, you're right. I should have texted you. And then they cut. And that was it. What is this? What is this? This makes about as much sense as pushing Umberto Dr. Dimples Carrillo again. Because all of a sudden, he's getting a little bit of a push out of nowhere. He's in the back. He seems all pissed off because of the way Sheamus has been kicking his ass the last couple of weeks. And then Sheamus comes out of nowhere and kicks his ass again. It's like, you're not going to answer my open challenge again. I'm going to beat your ass right now. Laid him out in the back. And then told Carrillo he's in no condition to answer the challenge tonight. So he put on his Seamus hat and his little Baron Zemo coat. And he flipped his little 1940 suspenders. And he walked off with the United States Championship. Who's going to answer the challenge tonight now that Umberto's not going to be in there? Am I caring about any of this? No, but I do enjoy watching Seamus being this very Seamus-like character. He's big, he's rough, he's tough, he's a bully of sorts without having to insult people about their height or nationality or anything stupid. He's just beating the shit out of everybody 
simply because he can. And I can enjoy that aspect of it. What I can't enjoy <laughs> is anything involving The Miz and John Morrison. They came out and were bitching about being hit with the tomatoes last week. This prompted Damian Priest to come out, and there was going to be a one on one match John Morrison versus Damian Priest, which thankfully Damian Priest won. And there was some decent action in this match, but I think they're starting to tell of the dissolving of Miz and Morrison, which I could definitely get behind if that's the direction that we're going, because it seems to be hinting in that direction. The Miz tried to aid John Morrison by getting involved towards the end of the match, which only led to him ending up getting defeated by Damian Priest. So there's a little bit of dissension in the Miz's little world with his buddy John Morrison, and hopefully they split that up sooner than later. Good to see Damian Priest getting a win without having Bad Bunny at his side. We seen Mansoor. If you don't know who Mansoor is, I don't blame you. But he's been on NXT. He's been on 205 Live, I believe. He, if you don't know him from those shows, maybe you remember him from showing up at Super Showdown or the Greatest Royal Rumbles or whatever one of those Saudi Arabian pay-per-views you may have watched. He is like their resident hometown boy. He's had a couple of really great matches and I'm into the kid. I think he's great, but uh, look at what they did to a guy like Ricochet, right? Mansoor is just pretty much another version of Ricochet. He's going to come in. He's going to make a big splash like he somewhat did tonight. And then he's going to fade away in a couple of months, just like everybody else. So I'm not getting overly hyped about Mansoor, who signed a contract in the back. He signed pen to paper to have his career slowly be buried and put to death on Monday Night Raw. I'm sorry, Mansoor. I'm sure we'll get to see a few good matches. Maybe you'll have one interesting thing that you do in the whole time that you're there. Hopefully I'm wrong. It's the one time I would love to be wrong, but, I mean, come on. Where do you think they're going to go with this character? Not very far, I would imagine. Maybe as far as a United States championship, and that's probably about it and that seems to be the direction in which we might be headed because Seamus came out and he mocked him while we were talking about Mansoor in the back Seamus of course came out and this is going to set up the open challenge for him later in the night we went to commercial and then came back and there was a match going on right back from commercial. We had Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin fighting the loser house party and the loser house party defeated Cedric and Shelton because that's what everybody does now. But it seems like WWE is making a story out of this. There were no entrances for anybody because none of these guys are important. They didn't really care. All they want to do, I guess, is put an end to these things. And the Lucha House Party was lucky enough to be the only other tag team around to have a tag team matchup. So let's have Cedric and Shelton lose. And at the end of this match, Cedric lost his mind, blamed Shelton Alexander for being the weak link in the Hurt Business, blamed him for being the reason why they got kicked out of the Hurt Business in the first place and why they've been on a losing streak as of late. So according to Cedric Alexander, just like Shelton Benjamin, this team is done. Cedric was good in this segment, but I cannot get behind this at all. I'm still reeling from them not being part of the Hurt Business. There is so much failed possibilities there. There was so much they could have done with them as a faction. There's no reason why right now Bobby Lashley shouldn't be dominating with the World Championship and them simultaneously be dominating the Raw Tag Team division. There's no reason why they couldn't. And you build up the other tag teams around them. Shelton and Cedric are that good that they could have a great match with any team. They've proved that time and time again, but they just are not booked seriously. There's no reason why they should have lost the championships back to the New Day going into WrestleMania. They should still be the champions coming out of WrestleMania right now. But instead, they broke them away from Bobby. And for really no reason, because they were actually winning and were doing more positive than negative at the time. All for what? To have them break up now? Sure, Shelton versus Cedric might produce some really good matches for us in the future. 
but where is it going to go? What's the goal? What's the end goal? They're going to end up switching brands. Is somebody going to SmackDown? Like, are we going to do something like that? Is it going to be a deep-rooted feud between these two? Shelton Benjamin wasn't taking this lion down. In the back, he responded, saying that he's the one that put Cedric Alexander in the Hurt Business. They didn't want him in the Hurt Business, but he was the reason why they brought him in, and he's going to... Uh, hopefully Cedric changes his ways and changes his frame of mind, but if not, he's going to beat some respect into him. So, like, there's an interesting story coming at us as far as them going one-on-one, but there was just so much left of them being a team. And it's not like we don't need tag teams, right? It's almost as if they're like, "Uh uh-oh, the Viking Raider Warrior Raider Raiders are back. We just made a new tag team with RK Bro. We got to get rid of one of these tag teams. Oh, well, let's just break up Cedric and Shelton. They're not doing anything much nowadays anyway. I, I don't understand it. I really don't get it. At a time where they need tag teams more than anything else, they just keep breaking up and splitting tag teams. Ridiculous. Then we have this very strange backstage segment. Angel Garza is walking around with his rose as usual. In the back, Drew Gulak decides to to kind of step to him. And he's like, oh, I'm going to smell the roses after I beat you. And then Angel Garza says to Gulak, oh, I accept and I'm going to shove this rose up your ass. Drew Gulak was confused. I was confused. Because Garza was like, oh, I'm going to smell this rose when I shove it up your ass. I don't know. Whatever it was, it was very weird. But we're talking about rosebuds being placed in people's asses. All right? I I, I don't know whose idea this was. All I could imagine is that somebody pitched this as a reason for a match. And they, they greenlit this. And we got Angel Garza versus Drew Gulak, which lasted about two minutes and ended with Angel Garza sticking his rose into Drew Gulak's shorts. And then he proceeded to kick the rose up his ass. So he he put a rosebud way up Drew Gulak's ass tonight. Yeah. Oh, I... I left a rosebud in them for you. <laughs> this is something that actually happened on Monday Night Raw. A, a grown man took a flower and shoved it down the pants of another grown man and then kicked the flower up his ass. And all I can see when this is over is a deranged 70-year-old man sitting at the gorilla position, yucking it up. Ha 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 Did you see that done? Ha 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 Did you see that? Bruce, isn't that funny? That Drew Golak, he's a character. I love this segment. Let's do more with roses up the ass in the future. I guarantee you this is going to be... Angel Garza's new thing. He's going to kick the roses up every opponent's ass the same way Jake the Snake used to lay people out and then cover them in a python or something. And it's going to tickle the old man's fellas. Ha 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 ha! But all I can see is this. Oh, I, I left a rosebud in them for you. <laughs> <laughs> I left a rosebud in there for you. That's the first thing I thought of. I don't know. Am I deranged? Maybe. But that's probably why you watch this show. You want to talk about deranged? We're going to come up with our new weekly bit. Riddle me this, my friends. Why in the world is Randy Orton and Matt Riddle even a thing? I don't get it. We had a segment where Matt Riddle's scooting around in the back like he's been doing. He runs into the Viking Raider Warrior Raider Raiders and he's like, oh, well, man, you like the Raiders or do you like the Vikings? Talking about the NFL football teams. And then he's like, no, I'm a Browns fan. And then he was like, oh, whatever, dude. Like, you're a sexy dude, right, Ivar? And blah, blah, blah. And this was a very cringeworthy segment. And then he sees his bro, Randy Orton, and he skates over and he's like, yo, bro, man. 
yo, man. And Randy's like, I'm not your bro. And then there's this strange interaction where, you know, Randy's like, yeah, whatever. We won a match once, so let's go win another one tonight. And Matt Riddle's all like, yeah, man, that's the coolest thing ever, man. And Randy Orton was like, oh. He didn't use any words. He was just like, zip it. Like, hmm? So Matt Riddle zipped it. And then Randy Orton took his zipper so that he couldn't open his mouth back up. And it made me laugh. I was like, all right, that's pretty funny. I get it. They're an odd couple. He's super intense. He's super idiot, man, boy, stoner guy. They shouldn't go together, but they're going to do the whole thing. Where is it going to lead? One of these guys is going to turn on the other. It's going to break up the whole fun time USA act. Probably going to be Randy Orton finally getting fed up with Matt Riddle towards the end. It would be more interesting maybe if Matt Riddle turned on Randy Orton by the by the end of this thing, breaking the whole thing up and getting him away from this idiot stoner character. But in that moment, I was amused. I wasn't amused with the... the tag team match that they got tonight they had to fight Elias and Jackson Riker because once again there's not really any good tag teams there's no real reason for Randy and Matt Riddle to be in the tag team division in the first place so unless they're starting them on some sort of a trajectory towards Randy I'm I'm sorry towards AJ and Omos you know them uh, taking on the champs I don't see the point of any of this Especially when I have to watch a match with Elias and Jackson Riker. They beat these guys in way less than 10 minutes. I'm, I'm thinking maybe this was a four, maybe five minute long matchup. But Matt Riddle and Randy Orton easily disposed of Elias and Jackson Riker. They are now 2-0 and as a tag team as they were one of the people that have beaten Cedric and Shelton on the course of their losing streak in the last couple of weeks. We then had Drew McIntyre, some super special interview they said we were going to have with him, but this turned out to just be some simple backstage interview where he talked about Mason Teabag. He's borrowing lines from this show. I called him Teabag from day number one, but whatever. I'm not here for credit. I'm just stating the truth. I called him Teabag before everybody else. Be that as it may, McIntyre doesn't understand why they took off the masks but kept the stupid names, which was something else we said on this show two weeks ago when they did take the masks off. And we're like, all right, well, but they still got their ridiculous names. All right, whatever. It is what it is. But he addressed Mason T-Bar on this night, but we wouldn't see them at all before the night would be over. So do they even matter? I don't know. He said he's focused on beating Bobby Lashley. He wants to win the title back. Then Braun Strowman shows up because we can't have a Drew McIntyre segment without Braun Strowman. God forbid that happens. We had to start this whole damn show with the flip of a coin. Braun, heads or tails? And that's how we got to choose the main event tonight. Now we got these two guys in the back. And Drew McIntyre tells Braun Strowman, just leave. Braun Strowman shows up. He's like, no, I'm going to win the title. And McIntyre's like, just get out of here. And then Braun Strowman just left like a douchebag. Like a big, dumb idiot. He just walked away. Okay. What the hell is wrong with him? Then we had the non-title United States Championship Open Challenge. Sheamus versus Mansoor. This was a very good match. I like Mansoor. I love Sheamus. I thought they were doing a great job. Sheamus was in full control for the majority of this match, bringing the new guy up to his level, beating the snot out of him, beating him up outside the ring. He almost was counted out, Mansoor was, and he got in just at the last minute. But as he seemed to be about to make a comeback... Dr. Dimples Umberto Carrillo comes in, kicks Sheamus in the face. The match is called Sheamus wins via disqualification. Now, this is one way to do this, I guess. But I feel like they missed the boat here. What they should have done was have Carrillo come in, go to attack Sheamus, miss Sheamus, but hit Mansoor. Get Sheamus disqualified, right? Because I don't care if the champ gets disqualified. I just don't want the champ being pinned 
in matches that are non-title or for the title for that matter, unless they're supposed to lose the championship. So I, w- I wouldn't have mind Sheamus losing by disqualification here, and you miss the opportunity to have Mansoor versus Umberto be like a real meaningful thing. Because now you could have Mansoor be mad at Umberto. They could both still be babyfaces, but now you have them go up against each other next week for the right to see who faces the champion at the pay-per-view. That would just be too easy, right? Is that why they're not doing it that way? Instead, they give Mansoor a loss, even though it's by disqualification. He loses this match in his first match on the main roster. After what I've seen on social media, many people saying this guy went 49 wins without a loss. 49-0 and 0 since he's come to the WWE. And he gets his first loss tonight via a really ridiculous booking for the involvement of Umberto Carrillo? I don't know. I didn't enjoy this at all. And by the end of the segment, Sheamus broke kicked both of these guys in the face, stood tall over them holding the United States Championship. Adnan called Sheamus a ginger-headed juggernaut. That was only one of the many gems he had on this night. Umberto Carrillo hit... Uh, hit, I'm sorry, Mansoor, or one of these guys hit something on Sheamus, and he was like, oh, here comes the pain. It's like, no, no, idiot, you don't use that. And then, uh, oh no, it was Angel Garza's match where he said that, and then he said some other shit when Angel Garza ripped his pants off. He was like, oh, when the pants come off, it's time to go. Like, he's just not there. He's not there. He's definitely not a wrestling commentator, and you could tell. Maybe he can get there. I know he's only been there a couple of weeks, but man, he just seems very uninteresting to me. Just about as uninteresting as all this shit with Alexa Bliss. Now, I'm a big fan of how she's portraying this character. I think that she's doing an excellent acting job, but the fact that she's still just sitting there telling us stories and nothing has happened yet... It makes my interest go less and less every single week. I'm I'm being generous. I'm giving the benefit of the doubt, you know, because we know this is the Fiend's thing, right? And the Fiend hasn't been seen since WrestleMania. He came back only to disappear again. They gave the whole gimmick to Alexa Bliss. Now she's got a little friend named Lily, who I hope ends up being Nikki Cross by the time this was all said and done. But that's another story for another day. But she's just coming out every week telling us stories. And now this week she sang to us. She sang the Daisy Daisy song, but she said, Lily, Lily, what did you make me do? And I'm sitting there in my house going, Vinny, Vinny, what are you making me watch? Because this Raw is terrible. And it's because of things like this. This is essentially the same thing we're seeing with Alexa every week. She's just sitting on the swing with her little doll. She tells us a little something and nothing happens. Nothing happens. Apparently she... As a target, because Lily's got her eyes on somebody, but Alexa's not going to tell us who it is. And even though her performance here, from an acting standpoint, is fantastic, I'm starting to lose my interest more and more every week. And where the hell is Bray Wyatt? If you know, let me know in the comments. But I know you don't know, because nobody knows. I don't even think Bray Wyatt knows where he is right now. You know you're sitting and watching Monday Night Raw when Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler are wrestling Naomi and Lana for the Raw Women's Tag Team Championships. Because where else could you see television this bad? Nowhere. Nowhere. It's not like we haven't seen this 17 times since the start of this year. And do you care any more now than you did that first time? No. This is the same thing as watching them fight Natty and Tamina. And it's just the same rinse and repeat match over and over again. Reginald gets involved. He causes a distraction. And the championships are on the line. So, of course, Nia and Shayna win. Even though they've been losing and losing and losing on SmackDown. Tonight, they win. And I'm wondering who this was for. Or what this was for. Did it make Nia and Shayna look great? 
No. Did it make Naomi and Lana look good? No. Did it make me have to see Reginald? Yes. Which is, is that good? No. So, like, what was this about? Can't we have one show where these girls don't wrestle? It'll be okay. We don't have to see them on every show. Two shows a week is too much for this particular act. The talent pool just ain't that deep. And what you do got swimming in the pool ain't that great. Then we had the main event. Bobby Lashley defeats Braun Strowman in this non-title match. This was your very typical WWE booking. Drew McIntyre, of course, was outside on commentary, which means, of course, he's going to be involved one way or another, which, of course, he was. Bobby Lashley mostly in control of Braun Strowman for the majority of this match. They ended up rolling to the outside, where Braun Strowman was thrown into Drew McIntyre, who then... <clears throat> I'm sorry, who then gets the opportunity to Claymore kick both of these men before or after this match is over. So this was all about what? Building up Drew McIntyre, Bobby Lashley defeating Braun Strowman leading up to this triple threat match, and now he's going to fight Drew McIntyre next week. So obviously they're going to do the same thing, but in reverse... Come on, man. This was so uninteresting. It's it's crazy. It's like apples and oranges from the SmackDown main event scene to the Raw main event scene. Look at what we had on SmackDown for the last couple of months. We've had guys like Edge, Daniel Bryan, and Roman Reigns just tearing it up in the main event scene on SmackDown. And now we got Cesaro being pushed up into that situation. Roman Reigns versus Cesaro, seemingly the new program on SmackDown. I'm way more interested in that than I'm in... With any of this, Braun Strowman just pushing his way in, doing the whole Daniel Bryan thing for WrestleMania Backlash. They're just doing it again. We're going to have a triple threat. And I love the the argument by, by Sonya Deville where she puts Charlotte into the women's championship at Backlash. She's like, well, you know, the men are having a, a triple threat, so we'll... Have a women's triple threat too. As if the only reason we're having this is because the men are having it. And you know, we have to have what the men have. Is that what her character is? Women's rights or something? An an equality fighter? What does that have to do with Charlotte Flair? I don't know. Why are we talking about them again? I don't know. I don't know. Everything circles back around to the worst parts of the show. And that's the majority of the show when we're talking about Monday Night Raw. But hey, you know, at least we had a rosebud shoved up somebody's ass. Oh, I I left a rosebud in there for you. (laughs) And you don't see that every day. We probably will get to see it every Monday going forward from here. And that was it. It was a very uninteresting, very uninspired episode. They're building this WrestleMania backlash thing. I don't like that they're calling it WrestleMania backlash. I mean, the WrestleMania part is implied, right? Because just the title backlash and its definition, you know, it's obviously a reactive word. You know, it's the backlash from what has just happened. You know, like an earthquake. What is the backlash in your neighborhood? You know, it's the same thing. The backlash of WrestleMania doesn't have to be called WrestleMania Backlash because it's already implied in the word Backlash itself. I don't get it. I don't understand. There must be some sort of a business monetary reason for it. But so far, we've only got WrestleMania rematches being built for it anyway. So, you know, WrestleMania was okay, but it wasn't good enough to have to sit through a second time. And by adding Charlotte Flair to the championship match, I'm already even less interested than I was when it was just Asuka versus Rhea Ripley. That's going to do it for tonight. Thank you guys for joining me here once again on Sledgehammer TV's Monday Night Raw Review. My name is Nick Nightmare. This is the team. Thor the Sledgehammer, the official Sledgehammer of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. His tag team partner, the World Heavyweight Champion of all the microphones in all the world, Blue the Yeti Microphone, the most important member of the team as always. Each and every one of you who 
can do so very much to help us right now by hitting that like button if you have not done so already and you had a good time with us here today. Share this video with each and every one of your wrestling buddies all over the wrestling world, especially if they need a place to come and vent their frustrations with the WWE, which is what you can all do in the comments section down below. Don't forget to leave me your thoughts about tonight's ridiculously long, excruciatingly boring episode of Monday Night Raw in the comments section down below. I'll be replying to people as I can throughout the day. Hopefully I hear from you. Don't forget to check out anything else you might have missed, which will be linked in the annotations up above. And if you are not already a member of Sledge Nation and you're still here with me at 40 minutes deep on this Monday Night Raw review, now is the time to hit that subscribe button. Make sure you hit that notification bell so that you don't miss anything anytime we drop the hammer on a WWE product. And you can only get that here at Sledgehammer TV. Nobody does it like we do. Thank you all so very much. That is going to do it. We are out of here. We will see you next time right here on your new favorite wrestling show, the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, only on Sledgehammer TV right here on youtube.com <laughs> thanks vince oh.